let's start with the fallout and talk privately of some retribution, payback, or at least a significant change in U.S.-Israeli relations. Now that Prime Minister Netanyahu, it appears, will form the new government, he clearly, his party came out ahead in the election. Uh, the president doesn't like that, can't say it publicly, but it was no question he wanted somebody else to win in Israel. What is going to happen now, especially the White House is mad about two things. Number one, they were mad he came, spoke to Congress about the Iran deal, so they're mad about three things. Number two, they were mad on the eve of the election, he flip-flopped on whether or not he would support two, a two-state solution, a Palestinian state. And number three, on the morning of the election, to drive out turnout, Prime Minister Netanyahu suggesting, essentially going on, these are my words, not his exactly, but paraphrasing that his base needed to get out and vote because Arabs we're going to get out and vote and shape Israel. Those Arabs voting, by the way, happen to be perfectly legal, legitimate voters. Yeah, I mean, if you thought the relationship between Obama and Netanyahu couldn't get any worse, it now has. And the, the issue that has really gotten to the White House is this flip-flop on Palestinian statehood, because that has been something Netanyahu has backed previously. It's something that Republican and Democratic U.S. presidents have made a central tenant of their Middle East peace plans. And what White House officials are saying is that Netanyahu has now made this his policy of record, and there will be ramifications for doing that. One of the things that we started hearing yesterday is these hints that the U.S. may ease up on their opposition to the Palestinians going to the United Nations. The U.S. has uh, vowed to use its veto power at the Security Council, vowed to block any efforts there, but now they're saying, you know, it is possible that we could ease up and let them try to get statehood that way, which would be a uh, huge shift. Yeah, you know, the problem is Israel's enemies, whatever you want to say about Bibi, they're playing with for, for keeps. Right. And the, the U.S. is going to be playing with fire if they're going to play these kind of games in the U.N. I, I am not a big fan of Bibi. I think the administration have, has every reason to be upset with him. But somebody's got to be the adult in the room in this relationship. And somebody's got to reach out and say, how do we put this back together and, and, and have you know, peace talks again and have a decent relationship? We can't have our White House ask, acting just as petulant as, as Bibi. But one of the things to remember about the U.N. is actually the U.S. and Israel are quite isolated. Right. When, you go, when you go to the U.N., you have these votes. It tends to be just a small handful of countries for, for voting. Years. For years. The United States has used its veto. So what happens, essentially I, stop so what happens if right. Barack Obama takes his football and goes home and leaves right. Israel completely isolated in the U.N.? We just can't right. do that. It's just, we can't well, do that. That's the big question. There's no question there's personal animus between these two guys. Now there are more policy it. disagreements between these two guys. The question is can they lift their heads and look at the strategic, take their name, essentially set the names aside, set their personality aside, set their pride aside, which is hard right. for a politician, and right. focus on the, this is the United States and Israel, not Barack Obama and Bibi Netanyahu. Well put. And that's what big boys do. That's what yeah. leaders do. Barack Obama's got to do it. I think you're not yeah. going to see a change in the security relationship, relationship certainly. The money is going to keep flowing. Yeah. The, the military assistance is going to keep flowing. I mean, peace talks, I, I think the chances were slim to begin with. I think that's going to be very difficult over the next couple of years. But the big question is, what, does ha what happens and, with Iran? And the, and the question, I think part of the question is, uh, you know, who goes first in the sense of can you be big boys? Can you turn the page? Can you try to get to a place where you can at least do better business together? Well, some of the reaction. Here's the press secretary, Josh Ernest, up aboard Air Force One, talking about what the prime minister said about the Arab voters on Election Day. Rhetoric that seeks to marginalize one segment of their population is deeply concerning and it is divisive. I can tell you that these are views the administration intends to communicate directly to the Israelis. So pretty clear, they're mad. The question is, when will they communicate? Secretary Kerry had a very brief conversation. The White House says the president will get around to it eventually. Okay. They're going to let him form the new government. Hang on, just before you jump in, listen to Elliot Engel here talking to Wolf yesterday. Democratic member of Congress uh, from New York, uh, very involved in this relationship, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He says here he's hoping that Bibi will step forward once he forms a new government and change again. I assume he was saying to his, his uh, supporters, uh, the others who are not going to be for me are voting, so you've got to come out and vote to counterbalance that. Perhaps it wasn't the right choice of words, it probably wasn't, but um, I think it was again campaign rhetoric and I wouldn't read too much into it. I, I mean, I hope, I guess, sort of hope he's right, except when you can't read too much into it, this is a part of your population. The, the Prime Minister is essentially warning Israelis that some of their fellow voters legal voters. These are not people sneaking into the country from somewhere else to, you know, I was about to say it's not Chicago. Uh, you know, uh, these, these are legal voters doing their thing. The prime minister essentially was marginalizing them. Some it, people, his, his opponent in the election said it was racist. It, it's reprehensible, if not racist. It, it would be akin, and what if the Republicans had, had said in, in 2012, hey, white people, come out and vote because the Democrats just want African Americans and Hispanics to vote against you. That would be terrible and it would be reprehensible. But what, what, they, what the White House has to think is, okay, that's terrible, and we can call it terrible, but the point isn't to, 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 to be the, 
the side that looks the best, right? The point is to get back on track with relations with a really important ally that's very important to our right. secu security and very important to a big part of our population. White that's House, what the issue's got to be here, not, not who can win this argument. White House clearly thinks uh, that the burden is on Netanyahu to go first, to prove that he's going to have that new relationship. That sounds we'll like see. kindergarten. Who goes right. first? Just right. fix it. Right. But fix they, it. But we've seen this before. Right. We've seen this before. The president says the Republicans have to move on this. The Republicans have to move on that. It's a back and forth. And he's got, he says a lot of these things with legitimate reasons to you know, talk about the other guy's tactics. We'll but, see. But we're not on a playground. We're in a global, global world right now. You sure of that?